Hello there, and welcome. Board diversity, and by this I'm talking about corporate boards now. Um, they aim to cultivate a broad spectrum of demographic attributes and characteristics, of course, at the boardroom. A simple, common measure to promote heterogeneity at the boardroom, sometimes commonly known as gender diversity, and naturally to include female representation at the board. Regulators since Higgins Review in 2003 on roles of non-executive directors, and then the worker review in 2010 that emphasized the significance of balancing skills and experience of board members are now diverting greater attention to focusing on diversifying the, diversifying the board. A move to heavily having a range of many people that are different from each other. Joining me on Icon on Air today on this episode to give deeper insights into the subject is Mrs. BC Adeyemi, MBA, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of DCSL Corporate Services and a lawyer. She's a passionate personality on corporate governance. In a little while, we'll be coming back to you and we are going to be unveiling our guests. Also on this episode, we are going to be showing you a few montages of the most unforgettable ICANN conference that we had, a bit of a testimonial, a few announcements, and of course, not forgetting to thank you, our online viewers and participants ahead. You want to hang on, stay put, we will soon be back.
So therefore, join me in welcoming Mrs. B.C. Adeyemi um, onto our icon on air. Mrs. B.C. Adeyemi, you are most welcome. Thank you, this Thank you very much. And I, I, I just, I just, and I'm sure we have, must have said that, um, that as part of the many accolades that you have, you just newly got elected as president of council for Nigerian uh, British Chamber of Commerce. I can only say congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Trust us not to get diversity, you happen to be the second lady guest we are having on ICANN and here since our debut. And um, to look at this board diversity promoting inclus inclusive corporate governance. Now, in my intro, I spoke generally about um, diversity. And I know that corporate entities, of course, we know they are owned by diverse shareholders and they are driven by different objectives. Given this, many have argued that both of such entities comprise persons with diverse democratic attributes and characteristics. Do you share this view? Absolutely. Um, and the, the reason why I do is because, you know, it doesn't matter whether, um, you know, the shareholders are of a particular demographic themselves, because, I mean, that's not out of place. You can have uh, founders who are all from either a particular tribe or region uh, setting up a, a, a company and then um, thinking that it will serve their best interest if they populate their board with people um, perhaps from the same demography as themselves, either in terms of age, in terms of gender. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that the board performs better when it reflects the way society itself is configured. After all, um, we're men and women. 50% um, of the world's population is female. Um, and beyond just the gender, it's important that as much diversity as is possible uh, comes to bear on the board. So regardless of um, um, who the founders are or those who have set up the organization, it serves better their best interests if the board is indeed uh, truly diverse. I quickly just. So I do share. I do share that position. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let me also ask you: mm. Is there a relationship, really, quantifiably, um, between board diversity and eventual quality of its outputs or policies? Without a doubt, and there have been studies and research in that regard. You know, I can read out um, a few of them, but the truth of the matter is that yes, without a doubt. So first of all, you know, um, if you take, for instance, a bank, just to give an example, if you take, for instance, a bank, um, and it has only male, uh, just looking at one portion of diversity, which is gender, uh, which, as we will proceed to see, is not the only form of diversity. But anytime you talk about diversity, everybody just thinks that, oh, it's a gender thing. So, but let's look at gender on the board of a bank. And the board that the bank is trying to play um, across, you know, across demography, across sectors, and it's trying to design a product. You know, management has brought before the board a product designed um, for the use of women. You know, how mm. is the board going to sort of imagine what would be beneficial uh, to females, even if the managing director or senior member of management is female and they have come um, to make that presentation from their own perspective, it's always better for the board to have uh, one of their own who is able to say, given my own experience because uh, of my gender, uh, this is the way that I think this product should have, um, should have uh, been looked at. And then if you take age diversity, for instance, you can't be um, wanting to be um, a player across uh, across demography, and then all of your board members of a particular, typically the older um, generation, because really and truly, there's still that perception in the minds of certain people that um, you have to be of a particular age to serve on a board. And so they miss out on that younger demography, and you have boards filled with, um, pardon my saying so, dinosaurs um, who really and truly, um, you know, are, sometimes have lost touch uh, with uh, with reality on account on account of age, yes. So, without a doubt, um, diversity improves the quality of the outcome of board decisions. Fantastic point. And then, um, digging a little bit deeper, uh, from your perspective, what types of diversity should a board have to guarantee 
inclusiveness, age, gender, you know, physical disability, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to be effective in corporate governance. Absolutely. So you mentioned some of them. The top of the mind is gender. You know, we can't continue to uh, we can't overemphasize that we're still doing poorly in Nigeria. Our percentages are you know below seventeen percent. So there's still room uh, for improvement in that regard. Um, another one that has you know in, in recent times you know come to the fore, particularly with um, with the advancement in technology and what COVID has shown, that we now need to begin to look at age um, as another um, subset of diversity. You know, like I said, you can't have um, all directors be of a particular uh, particular age. Um, of course, there's also um, ethnicity. You know, it's a touchy subject for some people, but the truth of the matter is that um, particularly when you're looking to do business, either pan-Nigeria, pan-Africa, you know, globally, you know, you need to have a level of um, cultural um, and ethnic diversity on your board. You know, just so that decisions are more robust and we we're looking at it from several angles. There's diversity of experience as well. So you can't because you are uh, a manufacturing organization uh, now have only people who have manufacturing experience on your board. You're not going to get policy decisions. So you need to have people that have marketing experience, people that have legal experience, um, accountants and all of those on the board. So it's a, it's a whole gamut of, um, of diversity. So just to right. there's age, there's gender, there's experience, there's ethnicity, there's religion as well. You know, mm -hmm. we have to be um, more conscious of all the nuances, all the differences uh, that we have. And as much as we can, I know you cannot, you know, you cannot have all of this in one single board, but you know, the board should aspire um, towards um, that much representation. Fantastic point, uh, Mrs. Adeyemi, and I will, I will pause at this time, you know, because of cultural affinity, and uh, for a number of us uh, who have had to work in multinationals, we are, as octopus, we have our hands, legs in different jurisdictions, natural, different culture. Um, I wanted to find out from you if you have anything to say to us. Say, for instance, where it should be all inclusive, including you know people who are gay, you know transgender, and they have thrown themselves up within some other jurisdiction, but. In some other jurisdictions, they, they are really not maybe legally acceptable. And then through cross postings, um, okay. what would be what you need to say there? Okay. Well, I mean, you know, because we're in Nigeria, I have to be, I have to um, look at whatever I'm saying within the context of what is applicable in Nigeria. You know, we do have um, a law that uh, makes it illegal um, to you know to um, indicates that you're, you're a particular sex when indeed that you're not. So we do, have, we do have a law that guides that. So you'll be really difficult to talk about that level of inclusiveness from a Nigerian perspective. But of course, globally, um, you know, people are beginning to look at, um, you know, gay activism and gay rights and all of those. And, you know, there's more effort to now then say that, well, if you want to have and engage with that demography, then clearly there should be adequate uh, representation. But um, at the moment in Nigeria, it's still a very touch and go uh, kind of issue because uh, we have legislation that sort of uh, makes that not totally, um, I'm trying not to use the word legal or illegal, but it's not acceptable, yes, in our, in our I, 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 I understand that uh, perfect point. Um, I can, as a profession, of course, naturally, mm. bows to rule of law and convention, and that goes for it. But I'd like to ask you, um, mm. as an accomplished professional, mm. what are the attributes that you will consider during the composition of board of directors? Mm. Okay. So, I mean, aside from diversity, because when I'm looking at the composition itself, I want to look at it in a robust uh, manner. So I'm looking at, you know, have we achieved the kind of diversity that we want, you know, from an experience, from a background, from a gender, from the age perspective. Then, you know, people have said all sorts of things about sacrificing merits on the altar of diversity. So I would now look at the competencies that we require on the board. You know, so do we require somebody who has experience in the manufacturing sector, for instance? Do we require a lawyer, uh, for instance? And then once we have those professionals or those people who have those experiences, I also want to look at, um, you know, their character. You know, um, it's difficult to tell 
um, from from interaction, but you know you can one can look at um, perhaps their uh, their track record. Then of course the chemistry that they bring to the board. The reason why sometimes many boards just sort of stick to their traditional, um, you know, either it's heterogeneous because you know the gentleman's club and all of that is because they are concerned about the chemistry on the board, the dynamics, and that if you're not careful um, in choosing the right kind of people or the right kind of person that might, you know, might not fit into that chemistry I have on the board. So that's also something that I'll look at. You know, what kind of um, a person is there? Are they on duly argumentative? Debate is healthy, is good on the board. But if I find someone who uh, seemingly is on duly argumentative, has a domineering character, you know, those are some of the things that I would not, um, you know, I would not take lightly in considering um, somebody suitable uh, for appointment to the board. I also want to, to see that there, you know, there, there, there's exposure, there's significant exposure, international exposure, you know, where have they been to, what have they done, what's their track record of performance, uh, those kind of things. And so you can't just say you're a lawyer, you know, and you flag that in my face and say that, what have you done, you know, and then if you're running your own business, what's the track record of performance? Because these days, you don't want people to come and fill a quota on the board. You don't want to just them to come and fill um, a spot. The rule of the board is to provide support to the CEO. So every director has to justify their place uh, on the board in that regard. Fantastic. Um, so let's go to the underside of looking at diversity, of course, mm. skills, balance, and what have you. But you know, um, somebody has looked at uh, board diversity and has likened it to a tower of Babel of socks where players are polarized, naturally sing discordant tunes, pursue divergent goals, and oftentimes work at cross purposes, thereby resulting possibly in the collapse of affected corporate entities. Mm. Would this be a fair assessment of the concept of board diversity, the form? It's not. It's not. And it's, not a fair and it's one of the excuses that um, boards that are not diverse, it's one of the excuses that they give that, oh, you know, you don't want to bring people of different um, backgrounds, demography, because you're just going to have, like you said, um, a Tower of Babel, you know, and then you have people that are speaking um, and respondent to so that's not, that's not what your board should be. Um, so that's where you know, like, the, um, the individuals that are going to appoint on the board, you want to be clear that they share the vision. You know that they share the vision so it doesn't matter whether they are male they are female whether they are lawyers they are accountants whether they're yoruba they're Igbo, whether they are british they're you know japanese what is important is that they share the vision they share the vision they understand their role as directors because as directors they're not supposed to have any other interests apart from the interests of the organization you know so the only thing that will bring the scondant tunes on the board is when people um, perhaps are seeking after their own um, self-interest. And so there isn't an agreement of minds. You know, there isn't that common goal that they're all pursuing. So rather than um, tear the board apart or, you know, make the board go in different directions, diversity actually helps to, you know, build a better team. Because everybody is bringing from their own um, learning, from their own background, from their own um, you know, view of life, their own world view. You can imagine you have the board that doesn't have, um, you know, that has people from, like I said, different ethnic backgrounds, including um, if you're looking at a Nigerian company, including non-Nigerians, people are bringing their experience from around the world. And it's, I think it's even becoming more so now that increasingly the world is now a global village where people can sit in Canada, where they can sit in Australia and sit, actually be sitting at board meetings holding uh, supposedly of a Nigerian company. You know, so really and truly, um, diversity doesn't um, create uh, cacophony on the board. Instead, um, once we can agree on the common purpose and the common uh, goal that we that has brought us together, then uh, without a doubt, I mean, just like a, a country like Nigeria, I mean, I know that uh, some, some of our listeners might disagree that um, there's, uh, there's unity even in our diversity, but I think to a large extent, it is true. You have families in Nigeria, um, you know, that have, that have, you know, um, because as a result of its tribal marriages and all of that, that we have uh, different um, parts of the country represented in that family, different religions. And really and truly, this sort of helps to cement uh, them together. So the same thing would happen on the board. Rather than it um, cause um, disharmony, it should actually make the board work better as a team. 
Uh, of course, uh, there has to be shared values, uh, naturally. But, um, Mr. Adeyemi, um, let's look at the SDG Goal 5 on gender equality. Okay? And um, that is stated and should be what everybody should look out towards. Mm. Now, do you think gender mainstreaming, in quotes, gender mainstreaming should be made a deliberate corporate policy in the recruitment of board members, especially for listed companies or yes, entities? Absolutely. 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 You know, um, there, there are different schools of thought. Some people say that if you, you know, you know, uh, allocate a, a quota, for instance, you know, so in some other countries um, where quotas have been allocated, that every board has to have at least 30% uh, on the of female on the board. In Nigeria as well, the CBN, uh, Code of Corporate Governance, uh, the principles that the banks have signed on to, you know, um, encourages them to have 30% minimum of 30% female representation. Some people think that if you now then make, you know, have that kind of quota system, you will sacrifice um, merits on the altar of you know trying to achieve a gender balance. I don't agree. Um, there's no way you would sacrifice um, merit. The basis of appointment in the first place is that the people qualify, and there are lots of women that qualify. People keep you know when we're having these conversations, people say, "Why do we? Why will we find the women? Where are you looking? In what areas are you looking? You know, where are you looking for them? They are all over the place. You know, there are lots of qualified women, but that excuse always comes in. So." Gender mainstreaming is a policy that has to be deliberate, you know, because you can't, if you don't put it on the front burner, the people will always come up with the excuse that, oh, you know, you are, you are wanting us to go and just fill a quota. No, we're not saying fill a quota. We're saying look for the best people, but be, be, make a uh, deliberate effort that, so if I have filled a slot now, I will ensure that in considering in shortlisting, I will shortlist 80% women. Do you understand what I'm saying? As an Very example, well. I'll, I'll, I'll show this eighty percent women, so that when I eventually choose, it's likely that it's a woman that I will choose. But in picking that eighty percent, for Christ's sake, they have to be qualified, and there are thousands, millions of women that qualify. You just have to make sure that you're looking in the right places for them. Indeed, Chukwe Meka last born, um, you know, one of uh, online participants was also really talking, as if reading your mind, that irrespective, they have to be qualified, even within uh, that, that, that diversity. Um, mm. I like to see, even though, you know, from your openers, mm. um, at the beginning of this discourse, you make mm. that point. But it looks to quite a number of people that um, whenever promotion of inclusive corporate governance through board diversity is being discussed, usually or seemingly or perceptibly, um, is mostly skewed towards gender. And perhaps mm. a little or no concerns to other attributes, um, mm. such as race, color, age, cultural practices, mm. values, ability. Mm. Why do you think this may be so? It's unfortunate, but that's the reality. You know, because anytime we talk about diversity, what just pops up in people's mind is gender, because that has been the, um, you know, the the advocacy for a long time. But truth of the matter is that that's not the only form of diversity. It's the most important because I mean, heterogeneous boards don't perform well. Clearly, you know, it's the most important. However, it's not the only one, and increasingly, like I said, there's age. You know. Some people have this perception, and it's not only in Nigeria, across the world, that you have to be of a particular age before you can sit on a board. So you find directors are gray-haired men and were well, gray-haired men, typically, you know, who have um, passed a, a particular age. In fact, there's, a, there's an African country, I think it's Tunisia, I can't remember uh, right now, but there's an African country that has passed legislation that on the board, there has to be a minimum of 35% um, um, of a particular, of below 35, that at least 30% of the directors have to be below uh, the age of 35, and not more than 30% should be above the age of 65, just to ensure that, you know, the, the, to underscore the point of, um, of age as a form of um, diversity. And then, like we have said, there's ethnicity, you know, there's, uh, there's cultural uh, diversity, and, um, experience and skills as well. Excellent point. This is uh, Adeyemi. And then, uh, of course, maybe, you know, tailgating that 
question I put to you is that uh, of recent women on board, women on board, women on board <laughs> has becoming a swan song. Anytime that subject of uh, diversity comes in, I'd like to ask you, what is wrong with merit-based or competence-based appointment of board, board of directors, members of board of directors rather than gender-based appointments? There's something wrong with merit based. And I just want to be to, to emphasize the point that the fact that one is advocating for more women on boards doesn't mean that one is saying, oh, you know, um, appoint women regardless of whether they're competent or not. No. And that's what men use as an excuse, that you're just asking us to appoint women regardless of their, 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 their competence. No. The advocacy is that there are qualified women, so please look to them when you are making your appointments. That's all. Nobody wants to be handed a freebie. You know, women are not asking um, to, in fact, that's not the advocacy at all. We want to be given the equal opportunity. Is that equality, first of all? You know, men, and the truth of the matter is that, let me just also say this, and, 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 and if you'll allow me uh, to say this. Sometimes, a lot of the time, and I've seen that happen, the women are intricately more qualified than the men. But because boards are typically constituted by mostly by men, they feel more comfortable with their own. So they would rather go and appoint another man who is not as competent and drop the woman because they're not comfortable, because women somehow, some of them have said so, because we've, we've done all sort of surveys as to, first of all, what the numbers are, and then why those numbers are abysmally low. And if some of the reasons are men don't feel comfortable. Sometimes they feel threatened that these women have come with their wahala, you know, and so they rather just continue with their own gentleman's club, you know, crack all those funny jokes, you know, without having the women on board. So it's not about tokenism. That's not what we're advocating for. We're just saying give equal treatment. Women qualify sometimes more than the men. So appoint them and be deliberate about it that we're trying to, let's even get that equality first. When we're 50-50, because we're 50% of the population. So let's even arrive at 50-50 and then we can start talking about, okay, we don't, we're, we're done. Then let's, let's begin to um, you know, give equal opportunity to everyone. Fantastic point, Mrs. Adeyemi, and uh, what's a better profession to look at presently in Nigeria than to look at the history of chartered accountants of Nigeria, where we have an amazing of a woman, I dare say, you know, with vision, um, new logo, new icon, you know, breaking barriers, shattering ceilings, including this icon on air that we are all looking at. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, we talk about, of course, uh, you know, I was referring to same, same chapter, new chapters that we are turning. Uh, I'd like to ask you when you get back to your <laughs> Nigeria British Chamber of Commerce mm. icon under the presidency of Mrs. Comfort Eitayo, is shattering all the records. We are there, we can always share. Now, based on vast knowledge and practical understanding of corporate governance, mm. in your view, which of these two will positively promote corporate governance? Board homogeneity mm. or board heterogeneity? It has to be heterogeneity. You know, I mean, that's what we've been speaking about, um, you know, all evening. We cannot have um, an effective board that is made up of just one gender. It's it's simply not on. You know, it has to be an heterogeneous, but it has to be heterogeneous because society itself is, you know, and if society itself is and should be reflective of, you know, the board should be reflective of society, then it certainly makes sense that the most effective board would be one that is constituted of both genders and in addition of all manner of other uh, diversity to the extent that the size of the board will allow you know we should as much as possible have uh, representation from all of those divers but certainly the heterogeneous board is um is the ideal Thank you very much. I, I, I asked that question deliberately. Uh, both mm -hmm. of us are Nigerians and we are speaking to Nigerians and even Nigerians yeah. in diaspora. I have yeah. seen situations yeah. where, you know, because of some cultural, cultural mm -hmm. close iceness, 
Absolutely. I mean, use that term. Some people say that uh, over over dead bodies, uh, a woman is not going to um, lick them, you know, uh, and I can see. I deliberately asked that question because I wanted you to help us emphasize. Mm -hmm. Now, generally, it is believed that one of the principal responsibility of a board is to promote stakeholder rights. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I know, I, I know, Mrs. Mm -hmm. Ali, you are a well-honed lawyer. Mm. How best can board diversity be implemented to protect the interest of both key and minority shareholders? Okay, so I would, I would, I would uh, protect shareholders with stakeholders because you know it's been established that the 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 purpose of the enterprise is not just is not just to satisfy the interest of shareholders. Uh, shareholders have now found themselves in a uh, basket of, you know, other stakeholders. And sometimes, depending on where you're looking at it from, shareholder rights might even become subservient to uh, other stakeholder rights. So that also emphasizes the need for more diversity. Because if you didn't have sufficient diversity, you will still be looking at things from the perspective of the shareholders rather than stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Stakeholders, these days, like I said, they are totally diverse, you know, there's some people that you don't even know how, and I mean, I, I just like to give you a very quick example, you know, just to underscore the issue of a stakeholder and how critical they are, even to looking at this issue of diversity. Let's say I come to your office, you know, uh, and while waiting to see you, I'm sitting in your reception and, um, you know, I just flip through the annual reports of um, one of the uh, public companies and I go to that page, you know, that page that has the list of uh, directors and I see that, you um, all the directors are male, you know, not only are they male, you know, that means to me that they're from a particular um, section of the country. And I get very affronted, you know, the company, I'm not, I'm not a shareholder in the company. Um, I probably um, don't know anybody that works there. I don't use their products. I don't use their services. But I'm very upset that when the 21st century, we're talking about diversity and inclusiveness, and this company is totally tone deaf to what is going on. And I decide to, you know, just pick up my, my phone and I go to Twitter before Twitter was banned or go to Instagram and I start to make posts, you know, detrimental posts, you know, saying that boycott this company, they're, they're not, you know. So I'm a stakeholder, but I'm a stakeholder who is not vested. But my, mm. the, my, my interest is, is, a, is a social, um, what is good for the, for the society. So I'm a social mm. stakeholder and I have mm. influence. And my influence can bring down the company if they don't listen to me, you know? Exactly. So exactly. If you don't have a diverse board, that's what would happen. They that's say perception. Happen. Yes, they say perception is... A, Absolutely. It's reality. Yeah, exactly. And and, and yeah, um, uh, one of us just flashed on and um, giving you commendation at, mm -hmm. at your prowess being a female gender that you have done a very good job. Mr. Mm -hmm. Sheung Odering Day uh, says Mrs. Adeyemi's contribution this evening um, is a confirmation of the female gender's competence in the scheme of governance. Mm -hmm. And he's uh, thanking, thanking you for giving us a time. Thank uh, you. And, uh, and by, by, by extension, I'm thanking uh, another female uh, who is uh, my president of council, Mrs. Comfort Ulu uh, Itayo, FCA. Now, I'd like to also ask you is there a relationship between board diversity and an entity's commitment to corporate social responsibility? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, the example that I've just given is one of it. Because, as, uh, as, uh, as a board and uh, as an organization, we owe certain responsibilities to society, one of which is to do what is right by the society. If a society is made up of um, men and women, and we only have men, or only women, you know, I dare say, which is not a very common occurrence, you know, we only have one of the genders represented, then we're not doing well by the society. Because the society expects us you know, to do what is fair. Fairness is one of the ways to deal appropriately uh, with, with the society to engage um, in our corporate social responsibilities. It's not just about, you know, um, going to paint schools or going to, you know, but doing what is right. And go governance is now a major part of, I mean, as you know now, we're talking about ESG. Governance is now a major part of even um, our giving back to society. What kind of governance are we operating? 
if we cannot have a, a diverse board, then we're not doing our best by the society because we have, we have in other words, told the rest of the world that, you know, um, the, the other half um, doesn't matter. And if it's um, an age um, diversity that we're deficient in, they were saying that the younger uh, demography, the younger people don't have anything to offer, which in itself says a lot about our, um, our uh, corporate social responsibility or our ability to be good corporate citizens as, a, as an organization. So indeed, yes, uh, governance, um, you know, is a significant part of our giving back. Because, you know, and governance starts at, at various levels. You know, people complain about governance at the national level. But if, as private organizations, we don't practice good governance, um, how can we expect uh, the same um, from, um, from, the, from the politicians? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Fantastic, madam. Great, great point. Uh, um, for our viewers, I'd like to say, if you are just joining in, I have been fielding Mrs. B.C. Adeyemi, MD, CEO of DBSL. And um, lately, uh, the chief sir and um, in Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce, and she's been fielding questions on this topic of board diversity to promote inclusive corporate governance and we've gone quite far she's mentioned quite a number of things now we should be driving to a close and then i'd like to ask you mr dm now you remember the sabans oxley act or the xox mm. of 2002 which mm. We read came about due to failure of corporate governance. Now, was that failure because it lacked board diversity, mm. it lacked competence, or criminal breach of trust? Clearly, it was criminal breach of trust. You know, um, but I would say that also, uh, if the, those boards, and if you go and look at most of those boards at the time, if they had appropriate diversity particularly if they had more gender diversity, some of those things might not have happened. You know, there's there's study, people argue with those studies, but the truth of the matter is that, that women sort of, first of all, um, people say they are, they are risk averse. It's not that they are risk averse, but they always consider what would happen if this, you know, women are more than the ones I would ask all the questions. Women don't have a problem with looking or sounding stupid. Women okay. are have an ego, you know, that mm -hmm. if, they look, if they ask a question, they look stupid. So women will ask management, why are we doing this? Why are we not doing that? So they are more, they are more sensitive to risk, and mm. they take calculated risk. Men will take risk anyway because they are men. Okay. And they don't like to look stupid. So I think it's a uh, um, diversity could have also helped to uh, foster some of those um, um, failures. Fantastic point, me, Mrs. Adie. Me and um, time not being a friend, um, I like us to draw a bit of a curtain on this. Um, may I have your last word on this very germane topic on board diversity and promoting inclusive corporate governance? Your last Thank you very much. word. So I'll say I'll just say in, in, in closing that diversity has gone beyond. Uh, just looking at gender. Gender remains um, a very important part of looking at board diversity, but it's gone beyond that. And whatever kind of diversity we're looking at, we should please remember that we shouldn't sacrifice uh, competence or merit on the altar of diversity. There are diverse, there are competent men, women, um, young people. A lot of young people these days are running their own businesses, so they're competent enough to sit on boards. They have what it takes, you know. We shouldn't take the myopic view that diversity refers only to gender diversity. We shouldn't also take the myopic view that looking at diversity means that we have to forego um, um, competence and um, you know, capability. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. And then, of course, right values, the soft, the soft skills. I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Adeyemi, for the insights you have provided. I am very sure that um, when next we call on you, you will come on to share more um, of your insights to professionals, to students, to friends of the profession. I really thank you. I also want to thank um, our online participants, your comments have been taken, so many of them, they are all being harvested. I'd like to really thank you. We are going to go on a bit of a break, and when we come back, you will see a bit of snippets 
of montages of happenings and testimonials about our ICANN conference. Please stay on. I will be back with you shortly. is not performing two to three. The permanent secretary, I am happy that you came to represent Mr. President and the Minister of Finance. Thank you very much. Now, you made a statement which is like to me a partnership between ICANN and the public sector. We've had some of your guys, um, Ben Akabweza has been here. We've had people in project office. We'd like to ask you so that we can say to the whole world just one word from you. What is your God feel about our new icon? The initiative that we are proposing and we are reaching to the world. Just one word. Well, I think uh, I would say it is innovative. Uh, it is uh, something that is welcome, and I think uh, ICANN should do everything possible to ensure that they stay on track and ensure that uh, this initiative are implemented to the letter, because it's going to be to the benefit of everyone, both the public sector and the private sector. And this partnership is important in order to reinforce each other's capacity. We need public sector accountants to have sufficient capacity to be able to do their work. And we do know that uh, private sector accountants have been doing a good job over the years. So this uh, initiative, uh, we, we want this collaboration to continue as much as, as, much as possible. We say something, ICANN is answer already laid out and our members spread all over the world in Nigeria. All we are asking for is for the public sector and government to just take a listen to us. If we are called, we'll be at your beck and call. And you have given us that assurance today. Um, on behalf of the 57 president of the City of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, Mrs. Olue Yetai, CFE. LCFA and FCA MNI, who has raised our banner to higher heavens, and his ESCO, we know that this initiative that we call ICANN on Air will be there to educate Nigerians, go to the grassroots, put everything in black and white. And thank you very much. Please give up real appreciation to Mr. President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. We represent what he does. I listened to Madam President when he said he's the father of the nation. We continue to see him as the father of the nation. Thank you very much for calling, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations to Madam President. Thank you. Very Thank you. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Monica Nosike, FCA. I work with the Office of Accountant General of the Federation, Abuja. This conference has been very, very awesome. With a very large uh, number of uh, delegates, far and near. Thank you for coming, man. Thank you so bye very bye. much. Thank you. you feel of ICANN on air, how we are doing at uh, this uh, 51st? Annual Accountants Conference. Splendid. Everything about this conference is wonderful, including what you just told me. We, those of them that have been following it up, they have been commending, and we give God all the glory. All, all thanks to you, sir. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Yes, Dr. Balasaka, uh, a member of the editorial board of ICANN on Air. Please tell us one, two sentences. Your good feel about how ICANN on Air has made all the shifts and the process in the in the system well i can on air has really been fantastic i mean it is another forum another gathering of intellectuals and great nigerians that will come not only for the greater good of the institute or nigeria for but for global humanity
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. The Dollar Night is from 7 p.m. My brother, Janet Smith, welcome. I wanted to ask you, how have you seen ICANN on air? How have we fared so far? Just one or two sentences. It has been fantastic. This is a good innovation. And I pray that we keep it up. It has been enlightening a lot of us. And we are grateful for the insight that the Institute put into it. Thank you. I must also congratulate you as the anchor. You've done a beautiful job. Keep it up. God bless you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have with me Omar Shalewa Ayo Lawal. Um, attending this 51st Accountants Conference. We just wanted to find out from you, Madam Moshalewa. I can on air is debut is gone viral. What are your views and what will be your advice going forward? Please come again with the question. I can on air has gone viral. Viral, yes. This I can on care has gone viral. And give us, uh, just give us your view and um, advice going forward. Just on I can on air. Okay, well, um, I think it's a good initi um, initiative because it's trying to, it's going to be propelling ICANN into, you know, into the public, and um, it's it's in a way also trying to ensure that ICANN is also, you know, in view of of, of the people. So I think it's a good one. Thank you very much. And, okay. the, and the conference itself. Well, the conference it's been an eye-opening one, especially in terms of. Um, um, integrity, um, transparency, and also I've learned a lot of things. You know, things like there must be a demand for, for, um, for um, what's the word now? For transparency before you can also get a supply of it. And they've also talked about wealth creation. They taught us about um, um, you must de have delayed gratification. So there are a lot of things to learn. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you very much. Thanks for your comments. Thank you. Yes, you had some of the testimonials of those who are present in the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, um, during our 51st Annual Accountants Conference, uh, where we had as a team trust in governance. Uh, of course, from what you had, people came, people saw, and people said a lot of hosannas. Uh, kudos to a seven president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria who has been able to lift the bar, shift the paradigms. Um, as a matter of fact, as about when we were doing closing ceremonies, after a grueling four days of knowledge sharing, people were still arriving in Abuja, they wanted to be a part, a part of this. Uh, that, that is very, very, very commendable. And I also want to thank um, our online uh, participants. Uh, your comments have been wonderful, insightful, very encouraging. One of the things I'm going to be asking, please don't take this alone. Tell your friend, tell somebody else. Uh, we have shown in a montage that says this takes place on Tuesdays and Thursdays, two times in a week, 6 p.m. West African time. And there's also, as been said, there's a chance for you to come and advertise your goods and services that will get to the nooks and crannies of our globe. Thank you very much for all these wonderful comments. There was quite a number of them. We'll be sharing them in subsequent, um, you know, presentations that ICANN is going to be doing. Um, I also like to say that today's show has been wonderful, commendable. I like the bits about our guests who came strong and have been commended. And boldly here, the place of women is not just going to be 50-50. We've had situations where women have proven their work and added their self to the great cooking um, that has become success stories of boards and other entities around the globe. And Nigeria, of course, cannot uh, be an exception. Um, again, I'd like to thank all our viewers. I'd like to thank 
the Council of the Institute. I'd like to thank everybody that puts this on together, my editorial um, committee members that work and toil daily to make sure we appear on air. I'd like to say thank you very much and um, still hang on. I will soon come back to you um, in two things I'd like to quickly say here. And that um, on Thursday, December 14, 2021, at exactly 6 p.m. West African time, also online, we are going to be having Dr. Innocent Okuza, FCA, our first Deputy Vice President of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. He will be coming on to deal with a very excellent topic. And that topic is ICANN Reciprocity Arrangement with Global Professional Accounting Organizations, PAOs for, for short. I don't want you to miss that. Tell yourself, put a reminder, like ICANN on Facebook, like ICANN on Instagram, on Twitter, you will be highly, highly, and I say highly enriched for it. Let me drop this quotation. Open quote. We should all know that diversity makes for a rich tapestry. And we understand that all the threads of the tapestry are equal in value, no matter what their color, end of quote. And that is attributable to Maya Angelou. I say it, continue to say it, be the change that you would like to see. Nigeria is going to reach for the skies, for the stars, irrespective of challenges we may be facing here and there. I remain yours sincerely, Akifatunke, your anchor. I can on air. Bye for now.